Understood. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, Mayor, we are ready. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for your patience. Uh, we had a special meeting of the City Council that was at 5, and it ran a couple minutes over. Um, so we do apologize, but we do want to go ahead uh, this evening and call the regular City Council meeting of October the 26th, 7 o'clock, to order. And I would ask our City Clerk if we could take roll, please. Council Member Hamilton? Aye. Council Here. Member Sorry. <laughs> Council Member Mason? Here. Council Member Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Here. Mayor Rico Medina? Here. And uh, I appreciate, and our Vice Mayor uh, was kind enough and will be kind enough to lead us in the pledge this evening. Absolutely. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, let's move on to item three, public comments for items not on the agenda. Individuals be allowed up to three minutes. It is the council policy to refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. The Brown Act prohibits the council from discussing or acting upon any matter not agendized pursuant to state law. There are members of the public that wish to speak on items that are not on the council agenda for this evening. If you could please raise your virtual hand and we will go ahead and have the city clerk bring you into the room. Just give a second. See? wishing not seeing any hands at this time and of course i know our city clerk will always stop me if i've overlooked um, we'll move on to item number four which is announcements and presentations um first item donate new or gently used coats for adults and children now through november the first uh this is thank you to recology for helping to keep san Bruno families warm this winter donations um can be um, dropped off at San Bruno City Hall, San Bruno Library, Delta Creek Condominium Association, and San Bruno Intro Real Estate, which is located at 180 El Camino Real. And so this is a program that has been ongoing, and even through last year in COVID times, we appreciate uh, them taking care of that as well. Item B, receive presentation from Peninsula Humane Society and SPCA on animal control services provided to our city and throughout San Mateo County. And we have just seen um, the, the president of the Peninsula Humane Society and the SPCA. Uh, very happy to have you here and welcome. And thank you for, uh, I think you're still at the office, so thank you for uh, uh, staying with us. And I thank will now you. please turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. It's, it's very nice to be with you. And I uh, appreciate the invitation to uh, speak with you uh, tonight. Um, I have a presentation. I'm going to share my screen here. And I think you all can see that. Hopefully you can see that. Are you able to uh, see my screen? Yeah, looks good. You are great. Okay. Um, well, what I thought I would do is just spend a couple of minutes in talking about um, uh, myself and PHS at um, a, a high level and then sort of talk about the services that we uh, provide uh, to the county and to uh, the cities in the county. Um, so I am uh, approaching my first year here, November 1st will be my first year. I had gray hair before I came into the, into the job, so just to... <laughs> <laughs> assure you that I didn't gain gray hair uh, in the last year coming here. Um, but, you know, I, I grew up uh, with a father who loved animals and we had all, I'd lived in the country near the Blue Ridge Mountains and we had all kinds of animals uh, growing up and I escaped uh, to the Rocky Mountains to college and back to the South, the uh, Wake Forest for law school. Um, never practiced law, but it's a great education to have. Uh, for anything that you do later in life. Uh, but I've spent the bulk of my career in nonprofits and foundations. Um, and that is in the last 15 years working uh, as a consultant with uh, nonprofit organizations. And so when the board um, asked me to consider thinking about this uh, uh, role, they
they said, we want someone who understands how uh, organizations work. We've got plenty of experts, and I have to agree with that, uh, in the organizations uh, around animal welfare and taking care of cats and dogs and other animals. Uh, but we need someone who uh, understands how to run an organization. So um, I have come into this uh, organization as a steward. Uh, I didn't come in here to, to change. I came to uh, respect what we do and to hopefully enhance um, what uh, we do here. Um, so one of the first things I did when I came to PHS was uh, to look through the uh, historical archives. And we go back to 1950. Um, and I read every article that was written uh, about PHS and the work uh, that PHS has done over the years. And we are deeply rooted in this community. Um, the, the old building, I'm sure that some of you um, went into that building or passed by the old building at Coyote Point before the new one was built. That was built in 1952. It was state of the art in 1952. But uh, over the 65 or so years that it was uh, standing, it, it had become uh, fairly unusable uh, for our services. And so we're grateful to have a new building, a relatively new building that we moved into in March of uh, 2020. So we are the local uh, organization that takes care of all the animals in this, uh, in this community. And so I say that we are the uh, community's partner um, in uh, caring for the animals that, that come into the, our shelter. Three locations, Coyote Point Shelter, and I would invite all of you um, to come. Uh, if you would like a tour, let me know. We'd be happy to host you and show you uh, this, this building. The Tom and Atlanto Center, where I am uh, here in Burlingame, and we have our resale shop, uh, Pick of the Litter, in downtown uh, Burlingame. Also encourage you to uh, go by and spend a few dollars at Pick of the Litter when you have a chance. So we spent, um, uh, soon after I came in, uh, the RFP for the contract was issued, and I spent the first uh, three or four months in this role working with my team here in uh, the county and a number of city managers, including city manager uh, Grogan, uh, on developing a new uh, uh, contract. And what I have on this slide, in there are, I can send you more details, but I wanted to highlight the areas that um, we get the most calls uh, about, and particularly in priority um, one, um, where there's an aggressive dog that um, is threatening a person or another uh, animal, uh, either domestic or wild animal. Um, we often get requests, uh, calls from public safety agencies um, to provide uh, immediate assistance um, and if they're involved in a, in a situation and there's an animal in the home or in, in the place that's uh, in that situation as well, we will respond immediately. Um, if there's a dog that has bitten another animal or another human, um, there's been some sort of injury uh, to uh, the animal, uh, we'll respond uh, within an hour. Um, and then <clears throat> we get a number of calls about rescues of uh, domestic and, and wild animals. Um, and the final uh, point here, uh, which I believe talking to the city manager that um, we've gotten some uh, uh, calls from your from San Bruno regarding mountain lions. And so we work in coordination with uh, the, the public safety officer or officers who are on scene um, and fish and wildlife uh, to, to capture um, the wild animal, um, if it's uh, threat threatening to someone. Um, so th th those are the, the, the priorities that we uh, spend a great deal of time working through, uh, <clears throat> getting clear uh, where the, the need was, and uh, we will respond within an hour to, to all of those. And then there are four other priorities, as you can see on this slide, uh, in priority two, we'll respond within four hours to a sick domestic or wild animal um, uh, or 
an animal that's been confined uh, uh, to, to the home or in some other place and priority three, um, the longer period of time, up to 18 hours uh, to respond to animals that are uh, running at large. They're not confined. They're not, they're just out running around in the street. Um, or if there's a dead animal that we get a number of calls about, um, or if there are animal bite quarantines where the animal has been uh, or needs to be uh, quarantined after there's been a report of a, of a bite. Um, and then within 24 hours, uh, if there are stray uh, uh, dogs that will come out and, and, and patrol the area um, to, in, in search of the, the stray animal. Um, and if an animal is being relinquished, someone calls us and says that they want to give up the animal will go and pick up the animal and bring the animal back to the shelter. Um, and then if there are no other, um, if there are no uh, calls in the preceding priorities, then our officers will patrol the city parks uh, and neighborhoods. Are there any questions about any of those? I, I just sort of ran through them rather, rather quickly. Um, or if you don't mind going through the entire presentation and then we'll take uh, questions from uh... My colleagues, thank you. Terrific, okay. And then in addition to um, the uh, services that are provided under the, the uh, pr previous priorities, um, we have services that are provided through the shelter. Um, we are open uh, every day of the year, 24 hours a day. Um, and so we will have people come in at all hours of the day or night um, and uh, uh, they, they picked up a lost or abandoned animal and bring them in. Um, and so we, we will have staff there to receive those animals. Um, the shelter is, is open um, at, at times when we believe people are able to, to make it um, during the lunch hour or right after work. So 11 to seven, 11 to six on the weekends um and we uh try to accommodate as many people as we can um uh, through the shelter um the uh we also have animal care technicians who are uh, there 24 hours uh every day of the week uh to make sure that the animals are cared for um animals can't take care of the take care of themselves you know so they need someone to uh, or people to, to look after them, to feed them, to clean up after them. So um, we do that uh, around the clock. Uh, and then we have a team of veterinarians um, that provide uh, medical care to animals that often come in to us that are um, uh, sick or injured. Um, and so they provide immediate care. Um, lost and found uh, information we provide uh, information uh, over the phone, internet, in person uh, to people who report uh, that their pet has been um, uh, lost. Um, and then we uh, provide sheltering for animals that uh, who's, um, that are in protective custody. If, if there's a, a, a family that's involved in domestic violence or there's been a, an accusation of abuse of, of the animal, um, we will take that animal in while um, the legal system, the criminal justice system works its way um, through. Um, and then we issue cat and dog licenses, licenses for uh, the city and we collect those fees uh, and uh, send them on to the county, excuse me. Um, and we provide euthanasia uh, services. Uh, we often have uh, people who call us and say that their animal uh, has reached the point where um, they're either too sick or, or too old um, and uh, to live on and they want to uh, uh, euthanize the, the animal and we will, we will do that for a very small fee. Um, and then we also have uh, vaccination clinics um, for uh, the residents of the county. Um, one of the, the areas that we get involved in every year when there are disasters 
we are called upon uh, by the county to help assist uh, in those disasters. And so we have volunteers and we have staff who are trained up um, and we have trailers that uh, we outfit. Um, and when we're called, we can, we're able to call up our volunteers and staff at a moment's notice and go respond. Uh, and then every year the county has a disaster preparedness training that we participate in uh, as well. In addition to these, uh, the services provided under the uh, Animal Services Agreement, I wanted to just highlight uh, some of the, the services that our donors provide uh, that complement uh, the services through the contract. So we have humane investigators. We conduct hundreds of investigations um, uh, throughout the year, and um, often uh, many of those are forwarded on to the district attorney's office for prosecution. Um, here at the Lanco Center, we have a team of adoption counselors, and this is where uh, adoptions uh, are, take place. Um, our spay and neuter clinic, um, which is solely privately funded, is located in the Coyote Point Shelter, uh, and we provide spay and neuter surgeries there. Um, we have here a wildlife care center. Um, we have thousands of, of animals that are brought in uh, by uh, citizens who see an injured squirrel or an injured bird, and they bring them in, and we um, uh, take care of those. Um, and we have over 1,200 volunteers who help us get uh, the work done. We couldn't make it without the volunteers who come from throughout the county. Um, and uh, they, uh, many of them come in to Coyote Point to, to work here at the Lanto Center. Uh, at the uh, pick of the litter, and some are fosters. Uh, they foster dogs and, and cats in their, in their home. Um, we also provide humane education. We run uh, a number of, of camps during the summer. This year, this, this past summer, we ran six or eight, I believe, in person. We went back to in-person camps uh, for uh, 10 to 12 young kids uh, per uh, camp. Um, and it provides an opportunity for them to learn all about caring for animals. And so we have staff who bring in their pets, volunteers who bring in their pets and talk about um, their, their animals. And we have dog training classes here at Lantos. Um, we have an animal behavior staff. They um, answer questions uh, by phone, online. Uh, we have a class going on right now uh, downstairs. Uh, so several nights a week we provide uh, training classes for owners. And one of the, the programs that um, I was recently introduced to, uh, the TAILS program in partnership with the Sheriff's Department, um, where we provide uh, dogs to the Sheriff's Department um, and the uh, inmates will care for them for a period of eight weeks and they train them. And our staff go in once a week and uh, train the um, inmates uh, on how to deal with certain behavior uh, issues, and we have a graduation at the, the end of that time. The sheriff is extremely uh, proud of this program, and um, we had a graduation a few weeks ago, and uh, we this week sent over uh, uh, four new dogs to the jail uh, to be cared for by the inmates. So that is the... Uh, that, that's PHS in a nutshell, um, and I will say I didn't put my phone number or email on here, but uh, I am available to you at any time that you have questions. Um, feel free to give me a call. Uh, the main number here is 340-7022. I'm at extension 309, so I'd be happy to uh, take your call anytime. So thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for taking the time and for being here. And I appreciate the update and presentation. Are there any questions from my colleagues at this time? Council Member Hamilton. So uh, no questions, just a, a couple of comments. I just wanna say thank you for the presentation and for the, the critical work that you and the, your organization do for our city and for our county. Um, I visited the, the Lanto Center on Rollins Road many, many times with my kids. Uh, we adopted our cat from there. We took a dog training class there. We brought injured birds into the wildlife care center. 
I encourage everybody watching to please pay a visit and take advantage of the, the many services you've heard about tonight, especially if you're considering adopting a pet. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Councilman. Any other uh, questions from colleagues? Okay, with that, um, please, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And please uh, go home and relax. <laughs> thank you. I hope you all have a good night. I have my, my little Zoe uh, in the corner here. She's not awake. I was hoping that I could introduce her to, to you all, but maybe some other time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you once again. Appreciate it. With that, we'll move on to um, our next presentation, which is a received a presentation on the city's new agenda management system. And for that, we're going to turn it over to our city clerk. Yes, thank you, Mayor and City Council. My name is Melissa Thurman. I am your city clerk. And um, I wanted to introduce this item. In 2019, early 2019, I began looking into agenda management solutions for the city. We currently have um, none. We basically take a Word document and I convert it to a PDF and then I pack it all together. And it takes quite a while, but I've gotten really good at it. Um, but still, it's not something that is really efficient and it takes a lot of time to put a packet together especially if they're over a thousand pages um and so we i was trying to find ways that will help expedite the process for the city and for future clerks and for future employees so that everybody's not having to stay at their desk and work on a word document and so um, i had several demos with agenda management companies and um the it staff that was with me paul vela and at the time, Steve Messick, who reviewed these demos, by far, we all agreed that PrimeGov was the best solution. And I re reached out to Joshua Herney, and he is going to be presenting for us tonight. But just for just under $16,000, we were able to find a really great solution for the city. PrimeGov has been fantastic. I've been working with them weekly since 2020, mid, I don't even remember now, it's been a while on building us a great platform. And we are now at the final stage where November 9th, we will be producing an agenda for the first time using this agenda management system. And Mr. Herney is going to explain to you tonight what the public can expect to see on our website moving forward. The cleaned up version that they will present to us as far as our agendas and also um, our committees and boards and commissions and the streamlining that we will have with um, applying to serve on those. So Joshua, take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, council. Really honored to be here. I, I live over in Alameda, so practically an, a neighbor to, uh, uh, you know, native to the Bay Area. Just really quick uh, introduction about PrimeGov. So PrimeGov, uh, while we are a relatively new company, about six years old, uh, our management team actually did this at another company before. And so we really have uh, the most experience in the industry. So more than uh, 20 plus years experience. And, you know, we uh, have a number of clients in, you know, our, our strongest client base is really in California. Uh, we have quite a few clients here in the Bay Area, San Mateo and in the peninsula in particular. So the city of San Mateo, Santa Clara County, uh, Atherton recently signed up with us. And so really excited to have San Bruno. And essentially what we've done is we've created a one-stop shop for the public to find both information about your meetings such as agendas, videos, that sort of thing, but then also about uh, committees, committee members, and I'm gonna show you that here in just one second. The idea behind this really, and Melissa's really been a champion with this, also she's president of the California Clerks Association, so really uh, I'd like to give my hats off to Melissa because she's really a leader in this area, is not only making the uh, information available to the public, but making it available to them in, in an easy to find way and then increasing accessibility. And so I'm gonna show you uh, some of that here. 
So as I have mentioned, all of your information now or will be uh, as of early next month will be available in one place. And so, for example, if a member of the public was interested in a board or a commission, they could come in and they could read the a profile of, of the committee. They could click here and find out information, uh, who the members are. This allows them to uh, comply with the MADI Act and all this can, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes to automate this process for you, but it does make compliance with uh, things like the Brown Act and the MADI Act much easier. If uh, there are any, they can then look to see if there are any vacancies on this meeting. If there is a vacancy, they can just go ahead and click this apply button and it's going to open an online application. Currently, people have to fill out a paper application and scan it or drop it off. And so this is one example of making the committees, the boards and committees more accessible, especially to uh, different demographics who may be more uh, focused on, you know, web uh, interactions and that sort of thing. So they could come in, they could fill out this information. Some of the uh, nice features are they can just type in their name and it will add their signature. They can also just upload a resume, things like that to make it really easy for people to apply to the various boards and commissions. And then if they, before applying, if they wanted to see what had happened at the most recent meeting, they could just click on this tab and then they would pull up the meeting. Now, uh, as Melissa mentioned, we're still in the process of rolling this out, but we will migrate all your data over. So just to give you a local example of someone who's been using the system longer, I'm gonna pull up the city of San Mateo and so uh, you can see here, uh, they have data going back to 2019. Uh, we have uh, other clients, we bring data over uh, much, much longer than that. But essentially, if you look here, um, it's basically organized. Uh, so you would have your upcoming meetings. You also have the ability to do a search here. So if I wanted to do a search on Uber, for example, it would bring up not only where that is on the agenda, but also any attachments. So it does a full text search. This just makes it much easier for the public to find information, can dramatically cut down on public information requests and other things like that. So it, it just, um, in speaking to clerks over the nine years that I've been doing this, uh, it really just creates a better uh, sense from the public that the, you know, I know you guys don't feel this way, but sometimes certain communities may feel like council is trying to hide things and just giving that access to them in a much easier way uh, just just kind of uh, counters any, any of those kinds of ideas. Uh, the other thing to show here is you would have the video for the meeting. And so if I was going to, here's another example of a, a local city, city of Albany, if I click here, it's going to bring up the video and and as the meeting is going you can the members of the public can scroll along on the agenda and see the video right here and so that makes it really nice this could be during a live or they can come in and see the archives afterwards you'll notice that we use youtube i know that's a small local company uh, for you and so uh, we really leverage that relationship there and a couple other things to show that I think are pretty great. So we also have this integration with Google Translate. And what this allows you to do is essentially translate the agenda into 104 different language languages automatically. Now, of course, I'm gonna translate this into Korean. Of course, it's not 100% perfect, but I think it does a lot in terms of opening up accessibility to different, different uh, populations. And then one last feature that I wanted to show, uh, because of our integration with YouTube, we also have the ability to timestamp. And what that will allow people to do is basically jump around. So you can see, uh, if I click this button here, it jumps to, um, let's see. I had this sitting up here for a while. I probably should have hit refresh first. But it will jump basically to this point in the video. So if I scroll down to another point, and hit that button here. Let me just hit refresh. 
So you can see here, if I click in on this button here, it's going to go ahead and jump to an hour and 35 minutes into the meeting. And this makes it so people can easily find the information that they're looking for, um, as opposed to having to scroll through, um, which as someone with young children, being able to access information or attending meetings and kind of logging in at the right time is, you know, just opens up a lot of doors for me. And so that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover today. Happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thank you uh, for your presentation and uh, questions from colleagues. Uh, Vice Mayor Medina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, more, it's actually a, a comment. I uh, just wanted to uh, thank our city clerk. Uh, we, This has been a long time. Uh, I, I understand she's been working on this and it's great to see it finally here. And, and this, this product looks fantastic. So. Uh, I look forward to supporting this. Thank you. I think it's already been supported. <laughs> it's here. Um, yeah. Councilmember Mason. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the city clerk as well. Um, years ago, I put PDFs for books, and it is painful. And thank you for doing it all these years. And I'm sure you're really excited about this. So I, I did, definitely don't want to prolong your excitement and you know your time. Um, I did just have one um, quick question, which is I love the look back. And so I'm just curious, is the look back period just starting when we start the program or is there a look back period that is going to go beyond um, the, you know, the initiation date of the this new program? Yeah, Melissa, can you remind me um, how? I, I'm sorry, is the look back the archived agendas? Is that? Yeah, bring the okay. The archive, yeah, the archive. Yeah. Is there, is it going to uh, start when we, you know, begin using the software program or is it going to start, um, you know, is it going to have previous meetings? So we are migrating as well. with PrimeGov, we are migrating two years worth of agendas and packets. So um, January 2019 to present day. And then um, just so you all know, we are also at the same time this is happening, we are going, we are undergoing a website conversion to a new vendor there. And so the website vendor will be bringing over, gosh, I think they have the ability to bring over something like 14 years worth of um, data. However, I don't think we have all of that electronically currently. So whatever we have on the web now, we will have the website um, vendor bring over if it doesn't already exist on the prime dev side. So we will at least have two years worth of data um, brought over from PrimeGov and then anything extra on our website, the website vendor will produce in December of this year. So very soon. Great. Thank you. And thank you for keeping this item at the top of your list. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not changing it. <laughs> Councilmember Hamilton. So uh, Councilmember Mason asked my question, so I'll just be brief and just say this, uh, this absolutely looks fantastic. Um, it's such a huge improvement. Uh, over, over many different pain areas, um, not 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 to minimize your pain area of having you put together those huge packets. Um, so just want to say thank you to the to the whole team, and uh, this looks great. Can't wait for it to launch. Councilmember Salazar. So um, just really quick. So I, I know that this is uh, this looks pretty standard on uh, compared to other agenda management uh, programs I've seen. And in that it uh, breaks down the items, uh, the, the items are created individually, and then we see them broken out here. Uh, but does it have the ability to then also aggregate into what we're used to seeing? Um, because if you wanted to look at, if you wanted to read um, your agenda packet offline, um, this doesn't really allow you in, in this particular view. So. Uh, if we wanted to have a version of it that looks more like what we're accustomed to, which is one large packet, does does the, the uh, software aggregate that way? It looks uh, like we're, we're showing. Okay, so the whole packet is there. Okay, and then in terms of uh, when we bring the uh, history in, um, I, I imagine we'll only have the the full packet for those, and not the uh, the individual or the. Um, the timestamp videos, which I think is really a huge plus in terms of uh, going back to, to research what's happened. Yeah, so we could bring it over if it had been originally timestamped. We can migrate data over with timestamps, but I don't believe it was currently timestamped. So um, 
we'd have to have a person actually watch the meeting and, and do the time stamping. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. It looks great. It looks great. No problem. And yes, and just to, for the record, just to answer your question, yes, the, the agendas and the packets can be converted to PDF, um, which is where Josh's I, um, cursor is now. Um, you can just click on a little PDF link, it downloads it to your computer and it opens up just like you would see the packets now or the agendas now. Well, I wanted to um, thank you for uh, Josh for being here and uh, showing us a few steps and people of the community what to expect just around the corner. I do want to thank the city clerk, um, Madam President, because you know, this is something when you when you came on board, and we hired you was that this was something that you would have experiences in other jurisdictions that you've worked in, and that would have efficiency and effectiveness as far as inner getting everything uh, together within the process that currently exists today. And so that's a big step um, for us. And so I appreciate that continued and staff keeping that um, as, a, as a task complete. And thank you for getting us to the finish line. No problem, thank you. All right, um, with that, let's move on to our next item, please. Receive a presentation and annual report from the Culture and Arts Commission. And this evening, I believe we have our vice chair who will be helping making the presentation. I am bringing her over right now. Thank you. I'm getting a little error here, so I'm just trying to bring her over. I'm also gonna bring over staff liaison, Tim Wallace. There she is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Tobin, um, thank you for being here. And Mr. Wallace, thank you for being here as well. And uh, we're going to turn over the floor uh, to the vice chair to uh, give us the Culture and Arts Commission report. Hi. Evening. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm not the vice chair. I don't know who is, but thank you. I am a <clears throat> long-term member of the culture. <clears throat> excuse me. Here goes my voice. Of the um, Culture and Arts Commission. And good evening, Honorable Mayor, and member of the City Council. Of course, you know my name is Melody Tobin, and I'm pleased to present to you the Culture and Arts Commission. 2020-2021 annual report. This evening's agenda will include the commission's members, the purpose of the commission, the commission's accomplishments for the year, and our goals for the next year. At the end of the presentation, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. The Culture and Arts Commission currently has six commissioners. Melissa Rolf is our chair. Pamela Madden is our vice chair. Pamela Gamble, Jean George, Janet Monahan, and of course, myself. I'm always last. Thank you, Mr. Tobin. Um, our city council liaison is Tom Hamilton. And our email address, if you would ever like to contact us, is cultureandarts at sanbruno.ca.gov. <clears throat> The commission is responsible for promoting artistic development of the community, preserving San Bruno's diverse cultural heritage, acquiring and maintaining public art, sponsoring programs and events that enhance quality of life, improving the image and character of the community. The commission achieved a number of accomplishments this year. This year, this includes reestablishing the Library Community Art Gallery Program, sponsoring the library's winter reading and arts program, providing judges for the Recreations Division holiday, holiday lighting contest, sponsoring movies in the park, and sponsoring a Dia de los Muertos event. Now we'll look at these accomplishments in a little more detail. The Community Art Gallery was reestablished shortly after the library reopened in April this year. New this year is a $250 stipend paid to 
to participating artists. The purpose of this stipend is to encourage more artists to apply. The works you see on this slide are part of the current exhibit. The commission sponsored the library's winter, winter reading and arts program. This was a series of virtual programs to promote arts and literature. The programs included art talks from the San Francisco Museum of Fine Arts. In addition, there was a marionette performance by Frantello Marionette, a traditional dance and music of Mexico performances by Cascada de Flores, a jazz concert by the Dave Rocha Trio, and a take-home collaborative art project of which you're seeing one of the entries on the slide. In December, the commission provided judges for the Recreation Division's Holiday Lighting Contest. The top three homes were selected from a total of 47 entries. The winning entry is the one you see here on the slide. Movies in the Park returned in September after being on hiatus in 2020 due to COVID-19. The four films screened Rhea, The Last Dragon, Wally, Soul, and Frozen 2, I think that was five, averaged 145 attendees. This is the highest number we've had in many years. Just last Wednesday, the commission sponsored Dia de las Muertas event at the Senior Center produced by library staff and community volunteers. Library staff have conducted a Dia de las Muertas event at the library for many years. This year, the event was expanded by moving it to the senior center and hiring a traditional mariachi band to provide musical entertainment. The commission is very proud to have sponsored this significant cultural event. The Commission has a number of goals for 2021-2022. The City Art Fund currently has a balance of $358,164. The Commission will sponsor a Recreation Division's Holiday Window Painting Contest downtown. We plan to create a directory of San Bruno cultural and art organizations. The Commission will select a new set of artists to display their work at the library's Community Art Gallery. Once again, the Commission will sponsor Movies in the Park. We intend to sponsor Shakespeare in the Park in October 2022. We also intend to sponsor a children's art project for the Community Day in the Park. And finally, the Commission plans to sponsor more cultural events such as Dia de los Muertos, Chinese New Year, and Black History Month. Finally, I want to take a moment to recognize Judy Puccini, who passed away in July. Judy was a Culture and Arts Commissioner since 2018. Her involvement in the Society of West Coast Artists Gallery on San Mateo Avenue brought a professional perspective to the commission, but more importantly, she was a friend to every commissioner and brought a calming influence to each meeting. We have missed her since her passing and will continue to miss her in the future. This concludes our presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Melody. Appreciate you being You're here welcome. and the presentation. Any You're questions welcome. from my colleagues? Questions? Not seeing any at this, Vice Mayor Medina. There you go. I was waiting for the for the comments, Mr. Mayor. So I, I, I pushed that button a little too soon. So I apologize for that. <laughs> just, just a couple comments, but I'll, I'll wait if there's any other questions. I, I'm going to say there's probably no questions unless I'm, I'm incorrect, Council Member Mason, and maybe people wish to make comments. Yes on the comments or no on the comments? <laughs> Council Member Mason, do you have a question? Okay. Comments. Vice Mayor, you're first, and then Council Member Mason. No, I, I, uh, fantastic. I, I, I loved the Dia the, uh, the, uh, de los Muertos uh, event. I love that we're expanding 
to include other cultures. The artwork in the in the library is fantastic. Uh, I highly encourage our residents to go check it out. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for your work. It's it's, it's great. Thank you, Councilmember Mason. Yeah, just the same. I've attended the Via de los Muertos um, for a couple of years now with the family, and I really enjoyed the, this last uh, week at the Senior Center. Very well planned. Uh, the library staff was amazing and well organized. We've attended uh, most of the movies in the park. Um, we've just had a, a great time at a number of the events that have been planned. So thank you so much for all the time and the effort. And I really appreciate some of the new ideas that are forth. Uh, I can't wait to see the windows um, during the holidays this next year. So thank you so much. And on behalf of myself and the city council, and you've heard from a couple of all of my colleagues feel, really want to thank you, Melly. I know you've been on and have had a lot of passion um, for this as well. And a, a beautiful tribute to Judy and a great picture uh, to conclude this with, um, with her spirit. And, and heart and love that she had for the commission as well as for the arts. And I have been around um, in this community like yourself and can go back to a time where it didn't exist or a funding mechanism didn't exist. And that's thanks to council member, former vice mayor, Irene O'Connell. Uh, and then this continues on. So I wanna thank everybody on the commission if you would pass on our thanks and appreciation. And I appreciate you being here with us this evening and, and bringing that forward to Thank you. Good night. Well, have, good night. A, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, you too. Okay, we will move on to our next item under uh, announcements and presentations. Receive presentation and annual report from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. And of course, I know we have uh, Mr. Smith as a staff liaison, and I believe we are going to hear from uh, David Nigel, who is the chair and I know I've got that right. And so, Mr. Nigel, if you are um, ready to go, I will please turn the meeting over to you, sir. I'm ready to go. And uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of our city council. My name is David Nigel, as you just said, and I'm the chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Tonight, I'll be presenting the 2020-2021 uh, BPAC annual report. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, tonight's agenda will begin with the BPAC's current composition and liaisons, followed by BPAC's roles and responsibilities. Then I will go through the significant activities that BPAC has participated in during these past years and conclude my presentation with the areas of future work for 2022. Next slide, please. Um, the committee is comprised of seven members uh, and two staff liaisons. Uh, and I, I'd like to just say uh, we have a fine balance of um, veteran members and three wonderful new members. And you can see them listed uh, on the slide right there. I also would like to say we have a wonderful collegial re uh, relationship with our staff uh, working with Michael Smith and David Wong is absolutely fantastic and they've helped all of us so, so much. Uh, with, uh, and they are our liaisons. And we also wanna thank our uh, city council representative, uh, Michael Salazar, who has attended our meetings and watches us uh, via Zoom. Um, our three new members have already been very active Paul Rose and Rob and Jules. And um, uh, the committee also has the following uh, subcommittees, safety outreach, public service announcements, and um, events. And I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, council member Michael Salazar for serving as our current city council liaison. Next slide, please. The BPAC is a quasi-judiciary body that provides input and advises the city council on matters related to walking and biking in the city. The, the committee is advisory in nature and is 
its input is considered in evaluating the effectiveness of projects, programs, and policies related to bicycle and pedestrian activities in the city of San Bruno. This feedback is usually in the form of recommendations to the city council uh, or staff. Next slide, please. Before I proceed to present the committee's accomplishments over the past year, I wanna pause and acknowledge the significant impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which has had on our uh, outreach efforts. During the pandemic, committee members were unable to perform the uh, type of community outreach we are used to doing. Usually committee members are present at local events, such as the Posey Parade, Community Day in the Park, Children's Day in the Park, Bike to Work Day, and making bicycle safety presentations in local schools. None of this was possible over the last 20 months. So instead of focus, our, instead our focus has been in the effort of educating ourselves using out, outside resources. Taking that into consideration, in November 2020, the fire marshal, our fire marshal, gave a presentation to the committee on the vegetation clearing efforts in Crestmore Canyon. And in January 2021, the committee received presentations from chief of police, uh, our chief of police on pedestrian and cyclist safety, and a representative from commute.org spoke about her organization's efforts to promote walking and biking in the county. Uh, and just an aside, when Walter Bird and I were appointed in February 2002, we uh, made a commitment to have a really good relationship with commute.org, who at that time was based in Bay Hill, and they've since moved to Oyster Point. And we continue to have a very good uh, relationship with them, and they give us all kinds of advice and materials that we give uh, at our information booth at to different activities. The committee is always looking for presenters to educate us on the latest walking and biking efforts that affect our community. Next slide, please. Um, um, the next two items uh, will be something that we're very proud of. Uh, throughout the years, we've produced and created many uh, public service announcements with the cooperation of our staff and especially Miriam Shalit at uh, Cable TV. And I'm going to play you our Dutch Reach uh, public service announcement, which was done at the end of 2020. And the Dutch Reach is a method of opening your car door in a manner that allows you to see oncoming cyclists from, from the rear, avoiding a collision. So if we could have that uh, video now. Our, our next video um, has to do with um, having clear sidewalks and placing the garbage totes in the proper place. This was done by uh, Gus Sinks, our vice chair, and Paul Rose and uh, the staff. Our garbage can placement PSA is the most recent PSA effort and was released in September. Our goal is to address the issue of blocked sidewalks, especially for those members of the community who are mobility impaired. And um, this was uh, done in front of Gus Sink's home.
And there he is. In addition to those that uh, I thanked earlier, we'd also like to recognize Recology for their cooperation in uh, uh, creating this video. Um, another activity was Bike to Wherever Day. And because many folks were working from home during the pandemic, Bike to Work Day uh, 2021 was replaced by Bike to Wherever Day. And San Bruno did not host our usual two stations so uh, that uh, a few members visited the one station that was at the farmer's market in Brisbane. And um, that is uh, one of our brand new uh, committee members. And um, we look forward to hosting our Energizer stations uh, in San Bruno in 2022. And uh, we'd like to thank Walmart one of our big sponsors at the San Bruno BART station and YouTube at the uh, Caltrain station. Next slide, please. The city of San Bruno plans to construct a two-way class four cycle track along the east side of Huntington Avenue, extending from San Bruno Avenue to the Centennial Way Trail in South San Francisco, which is currently in the design con concept phase of work. Because the project was identified in the walk and bike plan, a very important document that we follow, the committee receives bi-monthly reports on its development. We are very excited to see this significant project progress from plan to implementation. Next slide, please. Areas of future work. Although our outreach is hampered by the pandemic and the cancellation of many of our key outreach programs, the committee was still hard at work and we are looking forward to continued implementation of the walk and bike plan, ex expand community outreach for children and adults and continuing to support bike to work day and other community events and activities. That concludes uh, our report and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Nigel. I very much appreciate your presence and the presentation. Any questions from colleagues? Any other comments or questions? If not, I wanna, on behalf of the city council and myself, um, please, uh, Dave, if you would go back and thank uh, the, the board for their work, their efforts, and all those folks are on it really, they, they not just serve on it, they actually do it. And for the video that we saw with Mr. Sinks, uh, he did speak, uh, we just didn't have the audio. So I don't want folks to think that it was uh, with, with no sound, we just didn't hear it, but I, I've seen it on TV. And then again, I, I just on a side personal note, I have to uh, thank you for all your decades of service to the community. Obviously, I think you're in your going 52, 53 years on Parks and Rec. And so um, very much always have appreciated all of your passion um, and dedication to this community with whatever group you serve with. Thank you for those kind words. I really appreciate it. And I will conv convey to the committee uh, the accolades that you just mentioned. Thank you again. And thanks for your uh, patience. And you and Rose, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. All right. Um, I just want to, it's not on the agenda, but want to just mention one thing. I think I'd be remiss. I'd ask for it to be on the agenda. And this was just a, a quick uh, on the community cleanup day that was held on Saturday, but they, but still waiting for the finalization of the weights on the paints and electronics. So at the November 9th meeting, there will be a very detailed report on the success, but just as a caveat to it, uh, keep in mind when we did this last time, it was a total of 264 cars 
and on this Saturday, and with thanks to no rain during the event, um, we had uh, 439 vehicles that went through uh, that facility. And <clears throat> I think by based on what it's being said, one of the main contributors uh, was the utility notification in English and Spanish that may have contributed to um, that increase. And so we appreciate everybody's patience. And also very much thanks to all the volunteers uh, that stayed longer. And of course it was steady pace with uh, no breaks. So it is appreciated. With that, I wanna move on to uh, consent count. All items are considered routine or implemented in an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless otherwise requested. Are there any items under consent that folks want to pull for a separate vote? Seeing none, are there any items that folks wish to pull for a, a comment or a question? Vice Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, a brief comment on uh, 5G and 5H. G, G and H. Yes, G sir. and H. Thank you. Thanks. Any anyone else? Okay. Not seeing that. Let's go uh, to uh, item G, and that was adopt a resolution approving the design and authorizing the city manager to execute a construction contract with JJR Construction for the sidewalk repair program. Um, Vice Mayor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, sidewalk repair program. Uh, it's it's always a great thing to have. I wanted to note that $225,000 for Measure G is, is being applied to this project. So um, I think that's important to note. Um, my question for staff would be, um, this is an opportunity for residents to participate in the program based on the staff report. And my interest is how do we uh, advise our residents um, of this program and, and what are the what are the particulars on the cost? If you can share those, please. Through, City Manager. Yeah, through the mayor. Uh, can yeah, I have, uh, interim Public Works Director Haywan Ritchie address the question? Absolutely, Interim Director Ms. Ritchie. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Haywan Ritchie. Um, the item before you tonight is the sidewalk item. Um, as we receive um, concerns from residents through various means, whether they be um, public, uh, sorry, San Bruno response or phone calls about concerns about trip and fall hazards. Um, we contact the homeowner and if they wish to participate in the program, we advise them that they are able. Um, if you recall last year, um, the prices did come in high. And so unfortunately we re had to go back um, and repackage the project and um, we advertise again. And so those neighbors who we had on record, we contacted them again um, for the interest in participating in the program. And uh, we contact them again in their interest and um, are working with them. That's wonderful. Um, the start date here is anticipated in January. And is there any time available for other residents to add on to this program? Um, potentially, um, I do know in the interim that we have received, so this project is not just sidewalk repair, but it also includes ADA curb ramps. And so I do know that there have been some additional requests and we do want to prioritize those ADA ramps with the contingency that we have. Um, and so if there is additional opportunity, um, you know, it may be possible if it's early enough. Um, we just want to make sure that those who, homeowners who want to participate, of course, um, get their projects in. Any contingencies associated with that get addressed. Um, if I guess if they let us know soon enough, there may be some opportunity. But um, of course, you know, the contingency really um, we're wanting to prioritize it for the ADA ramps. Any unforeseen conditions that come up, um, and if there's opportunity, um, they can contact Public Works. Um, it, it, primarily depends on when they catch us. If um, they've completely done all of the demo work um, and, and they're not coming back, we, we would want to avoid a, a remobilization cost. And so um, if there is interest, you know, we would just want homeowners to contact us early. If not, this is a continuing program. Um, and 
So for those locations where we know that there were trip and fall hazards, we have contacted the homeowners um, proactively. And so, uh, you know, they can always be added to a list later if they want to participate. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Any other uh, questions from colleagues on item H? I'm sorry, item G. So let's move on to item H, adopt a resolution approving the design authorizing the city manager to ex execute a con construction contract with Grana Construction Group, <clears throat> the senior center parking lot overlay and the trash enclosure project. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as many of us probably know, uh, this this is a is a, a concern of our uh, our our seniors at, at the senior center and, and, and how old they've been waiting for this. And, and I think this is great. I wanted to uh, thank staff for, for being able to squeeze this in. Um, if, if staff could uh, provide a, just a really something brief on, on the construction schedule and how, uh, what, how it's being planned to avoid uh, the busy activity at the senior center. Yes, we will work with the park staff in their programming. Um, they will, um, there are some ramping up time, of course, you have to provide their submittals, there's some shop drawings associated with the new trash enclosure. Um, and so we could time when we provide the notice to proceed um, with the collaboration with parks. And um, we have already uh, discussed with some uh, park staff regarding um, accommodating entrance and so that um, the, there's still access to the senior center. There will be, it, within the contract documents themselves, we indicated that um, access to the kitchen should be maintained, shall be maintained at all times. Um, and then uh, they shall also co coordinate with city staff in order to provide, um, you know, accommodations to, to the senior center. So as um, if we're able to avoid, you know, known um, very heavy periods, then, um, you know, we can try to schedule that around um, with the notice to proceed. Um, and then otherwise it would be, you know, coordination and communication with the, um, with the contractor. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Any, other any other questions from colleagues? I, I do have just, if you could, uh, Mr. Richie, if you could just clarify for the viewing public is these monies that are there, where they came from or to pay for both projects. No, um, I have David Wong on the call. I don't want to get it wrong. I know that there was um, grant funding. And so um, if we could bring David Wong. He should be coming in right now. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening, members of the City Council. Uh, David Wong, uh, Principal Engineer. Um, to answer the question, um, the city was uh, fortunate to get um, for both the trash enclosure and the uh, senior center parking lot, uh, the senior center uh, bequest funds. Thank you, and it's not the center itself, but it's, it's monies that have been given through means to that, and the senior advisory board took this topic up and uh, approved that, which we, uh, thanked and, and approved that as well. So just wanted that. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wong, Ms. Ritchie for clarifying. Any other comments or questions on H? Okay. Um, is there any actions on items that are, um, any action on consent, please? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. A second. Motion made, second in Hamilton Salazar. Roll call, please. Council member Hamilton. Aye. Council Member Mason. Oh. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Motion carried. Okay. Um, I just, for my colleagues, we are going to have a um, public hearing and we're going to be taking um, both both the items up together as one and so what i'm going to suggest um is as well it's still early enough okay i was going to say take a break but i think we can we can proceed um uh is that okay with everybody or because i know you guys everybody came from a five o'clock 
through now. That's why I was wanting to, to ask. Okay. Yes, Vice Chair. No? Yes? Uh, if you wanted to take a five-minute break, okay. I'd be okay with it. Okay. All right. Um, what we're going to do is at 8.12, we're going to take a five-minute break and reconvene, and then we'll get into the conduct of business. Thank you, Vice Chair. Good night, Mr. Mayor. You're right. <laughs> uh, take take a break whenever you can. Is is uh, what some uh, person told me many years ago. All right. Okay, I have this uh, back at eight seventeen. And we'll go go ahead and reconvene the San Bruno City Council meeting after having a five minute uh, recess. And at this time, we are going to move to item six, which is a public hearing. And um, um, City Clerk. Item six A, hold a public hearing and adopt the following resolutions. Resolution one. Resolution adopting the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan is required by the state's water code and instructing staff to submit the final 2020 Urban Water Management Plan to the Department of Water Resources. Resolution two, resolution adopting the City of San Bruno Water Shortage Contingency Plan update and instructing staff to submit as part of the final 2020 Urban Water Management Plan to the Department of Water Resources. Thank you for reading both of those, and I'm sorry, I should have seen this. Council uh, Member Mason uh, with us? Council, there we go. Okay, just wanted to make sure before we continue. We just read the items on the public hearing, and so now we're going to move it into um, for staff. And uh, I can see Ms. Ritchie is going to help to... Uh, lead us and has some support folks with her as well. Interim Director Ritchie. Yes, thank you so much, um, Mayor Medina. Uh, I have slides to share. Um, Uh, thank you, Honorable Mayor, um, Council Members, Haywan Ritchie, Interim Public Works Director. The item I have before you tonight is the adoption of resolutions for the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. Um, so every five years, the state requires urban water suppliers to update their urban water management plan and water shortage contingency plan. Public Works staff and their consultant, West Joseph Associates, work together on preparing these plans and are here tonight to hold a public hearing and recommend adoption of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. At this time, I would like to introduce our consultant, Amy Kwong, with West Joseph Associates, who will be presenting a PowerPoint presentation of both plans. West Joseph is the city's water engineering consultant. They have assisted the city with its updates to various um, water efforts such as water master plan uh, running the city's hydraulic model to assess development impacts related to the water system and provide recommendations for any improvements that are needed for the, uh, associated with the development and most recently they assisted the city in preparing the water supply assessment for the bay hill specific plan uh, so without further ado what i would like to do is turn this over to amy thanks Haywan. let me share my screen Does everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Good. Um, sorry, I wanted to share. Start video. Okay. Well, thank you, Haywan. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. This project was started seven months ago, so city staff and I are very excited to get to this stage and be able to present to the city on their 2020 urban water management plan and water shortage contingency plan. 
So what is that urban water management plan? So some background on that. Um, basically, it's a plan um, that evaluates the city's water supply and water demands through 2045. It's a long-term planning document. It evaluates the availability and the reliability of your water supplies to meet your current and future water demands. And it's also a document that helps inform water supply assessments for proposed development projects, some of those larger projects that require a WSA as required by Senate Bill 610 and Senate Bill 221. So why is the Urban Water Management Plan required? It's required under the Urban Water Management Planning Act, AB 797, and also the requirements are in the California Water Code, sections 10608 to 10657, and it applies to any urban water, supply, water supplier who directly or indirectly serves more than 3,000 customers or delivers more than 3,000 acre feet of water per year. And it requires an update every five years. And it helps the city maintain its eligibility for state grants and loans. So in fiscal year 2019-20, um, the city served 11,902 connections, so greater than the 3,000 customers. And the city also delivered 3.12 million gallons per day, MGD, of water, or equivalent to about 3,500 acre feet of water per year to their customers. Therefore, an urban water management plan is required. So first, a big thanks to city staff. We had to provide all the information we needed in order to complete the plan. As you can see here, there are lots of components in the urban water management plan. Some of the key ones include a lay description, which we've included as the executive summary. We need to provide the water demand projections to 2045. Um, we also document the conservation target compliance, also known as SBX 7x7. Um, we also um, document the city's water supply availability and reliability. And one of the new components of the 2020 urban water management plans is a drought risk assessment, looking at the city's supplies for the next five years, assuming a multiple year drought. Um, lots of updates on the water shortage contingency plan and also updates to the city's demand management measures. The following slides will present some of these key components of the urban plan. So diving into the Water Conservation Act of 2009, also known as SBX 77, as well as 20 by 2020, which is to achieve a 20% reduction in per capita water use statewide by 2020. So targets were set um, in the 2010 urban water management plan, and it required um, suppliers to adopt per capita water use targets to, for 2015 and 2020. As you can see in the graph here, the target for the city for 2015 and 2020 is 124 gallons per capita per day. In 2015, the city um, averaged 71 GPCD, and then in 2020, it's 69 GPCD. So um, the city has met both of their targets. So going into historical and projected water uh, demands for the city, wanted to talk about the historical first. Um, in 2015, the city used 3.14 MGD. And five years later, in 2020, the water use is almost the same at 3.12 MGD. Although there has been growth um, in the city, however, the continued conservation from your customers and as well as installation of newer fixtures that require less water has helped you maintain this lower level of water use. However, in the future, based on planned developments that are coming into the city, um, there will be growth projected. Um, the assumption for build out is 2040 for the city and water demands are projected to increase to 4.78 million gallons per day by 2040. The, these projections are consistent with the city's water master plan that we're also updating. So going to projected water supplies. So in a normal water year, the city um, can receive up to 3.2 MGD of water from SFPUC. 
It also receives 0 0.05 MGD of water from North Coast County Water District. It's a very small amount that supplies the Crystal Springs Terrace Apartments. Um, the supply is also from SFPC, but it's just different contracts. Um, the city also has groundwater supplies up to 2.1 MGD. So um, groundwater supplies is a really key component of the city's water supply portfolio because it really helps you, um, and especially the drought years, when the reliability of SFPUC supplies decrease quite significantly. Um, and this is because of the new constraint, um, the Bay Delta Plan Amendment. And basically the amendment requires um, additional flows in the San Joaquin River, and that reduces the amount of supply available to SFPUC during dry years. And the impacts are quite significant, like I mentioned. Um, in multiple dry years, it can be more than a 50% cutback possible on your SFPUC supplies. And like I mentioned, this is where your groundwater supplies are really important to balance that reduction. I do wanna note that the Bay Delta Plan Amendment comes with a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, there are pending lawsuits and then a lot of efforts to have the State Water Resources Control Board adopt the voluntary agreement to reduce the amount of unimpaired flows that needs to go to the San Joaquin River. And going to the water shortage contingency plan, um, this is important because as you can see with reduction in supplies, the city needs to have a plan to prepare and respond to water shortages. And the water shortage contingency plan can be used for foreseeable events such as drought or unforeseeable emergencies. We have prepared it as appendix to the urban water management plan so that it may be updated independently depending on conditions as they change, and which is also why we recommend to adopt it as a separate resolution. We've made updates to the plan so that it conforms to the state standard water shortage stages. There's now six uh, standard stages, and one of the stages needs to address a supply reduction greater than 50%. And there's also new requirements for annual water supply and demand assessment. So in summary, what does the urban water management plan say about supplies through 2045? So the urban plan demonstrates that supplies can meet your existing and projected water demands during your normal years through 2045. During your single dry years, the city may experience a water shortage between five to 19% starting in 2035. When we look at multiple dry years, such as a five-year dry period, the city may experience a water shortage between two to 24% starting in 2030. I do wanna note that these are compared to your projected growth demand. So it does include the uh, projected growth and build out demand. So these shortages are because of some of the growth. Um, but for reference, I do wanna note that the city achieved a 20% conservation during the last 2012 to 2016 drought. So although the shortfalls are significant cutbacks from SFPUC due to the Bay Delta plan, we are planning for that, the worst case in this 2020 urban plan. But because of uncertainty, you know, if we look at, you know, the other bookend, if we didn't have the Bay Delta plan, there wouldn't really be any supply shortfalls um, nearly eliminated and it'll be close to like 1% shortage in the fourth and fifth dry years um, in the later years of a five-year drought. Obviously, you know, we can't plan for that. We're gonna plan, you know, for the worst case scenario, just like what SFPUC is showing in their urban plan. But we do update these plans every five years. So we will know um, how Bay Delta plan is implemented five years from now. Um, so in the event of um, projected shortfall, the city can implement its water shortage contingency plan between stages one, two, three to address any of the shortfalls that we projected. So some public outreach and key dates. Um, prior to the city council meeting, we've provided 60 day notices to 
the county surrounding agencies, OSCA, and other stakeholders. Um, October 11th, um, the notice of public hearing to the city, county, and public were provided. And between October 11th and October 22nd was the public review period. We needed a 14-day minimum. There were also two notices in the local, local newspaper. Today, we're having the public hearing. Uh, we're going to ask City Council to consider adopting the Urban Water Management Plan and the Water Shortage Contingency Plan. And within 30 days of adoption, the documents need to be submitted to DWR, as well as the State Library, County, and made available for public review. So proposed action items for today is to conduct the public hearing for both plans and consider adoption of the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. That concludes the presentation and we can open up for questions and public hearing. Thank you very much. Um, was there anything else, uh, Ms. Ritchie, that you wanted to add before I open for public hearing? Um, yes, I wanted to add that a um, large contributor to this project was Mark Reinhardt. He has been a, a long-term city employee. He works with Amy Kwong and has been a strong advocate for a water system for many years. Um, and so uh, he is also available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again. I appreciate it. Okay, at this time, if we could, um, um, if it's okay, if you could stop sharing the screen, and then I'll go ahead and ask at this time, this is a public hearing. So I'm going to go ahead and if there's anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item, if you could raise your hand at this time. Once we do close public hearing, uh, there will not be another opportunity in which to speak. So again, this is a uh, last call for anyone from the community that wishes to speak on this topic. Seeing none at this time, if I could have action from council to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion seconded. Hamilton Salazar to close public hearing. Roll call, please. Council member Hamilton. Aye. Council member Mason. Aye. Council member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Now I'd like to have any questions uh, from colleagues on the presentation and the items on the two resolutions. If there are no questions at this time um, on those two items, Vice Mayor Medina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and staff for the presentation. Um, I guess, I guess what what I hear most as we as we proceed with development in San Bruno is do we have enough water now? Will we have enough water to handle these projects and especially within a drought? And and, and based on this presentation, we do. Um, my question is on the projected uh, growth in our city, does it how 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 inclusive is, is that? Is that with the transit corridor plan? Is it the additional 3,300 units that are identified in our regional housing? Um, I was wondering if staff could, could just uh, touch upon that for a little bit. Um, yes, I can answer to that. Um, that this plan is for build out for 2045. And so it does project into the future. It includes uh, the tr uh, transit corridors plan, other development that is anticipated um, in the region for San Bruno, as well as the Bay Hill specific plan that is an inclusive of, um, of, of those projections. Great. And just a, just a little clarification. So we, we currently have enough water from the SFPUC and in the event that we did get that significant haircut of 50%, we are allowed to pump up to 2 million gallons of water so that we have enough water to, to meet our demand. Is, is, is that accurate? I may ask. Yeah, oh. I can help. <laughs> um, yes, it's up to 2.1 MGD. Okay. So we are well 
uh, within comfort uh, to, to, to have enough water. Yet that doesn't mean that we should be wasteful. And, and with all the, uh, as you showed in that first graph, from 12, 2015 to 2020, we've actually seen a reduction in our, in our, in our water usage per person. That's correct. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Seeing no other hands at this time, uh, they are, uh, there's two resolutions that need to be taken separately. Is there any action on the first resolution? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, oh, please go ahead, Mike. You guys can switch. No, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. You take it. Okay. Um, uh, I'd like to, um, Make a motion to introduce the resolution adopting the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan as required by the state's water code and instructing staff to submit the final 2020 Urban Water Management Plan to the Department of Water Resources. And I'll second that motion. Uh, Hamilton Salazar, motion second. Roll call, please. Okay, but we have a Hamilton Salazar night going forward. <laughs> Council Member Hamilton. Aye. Council Member Mason. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Motion carries. And we do have a second resolution. Uh, <laughs> and any introductions from. No, uh, let's continue the trend. All right, go ahead. Really? Okay. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Salazar. I would like to make a motion to introduce the resolution adopting the City of San Bruno Water Shortage Contingency Plan update and instructing staff to submit as part of the final 2020 Urban Water Management Plan to the Department of Water Resources. And I will second that motion. I'm making my minute motion. easy. M motion made and second. Uh, Hamilton Salazar, roll call, please. Council Member Hamilton. Aye. Council Member Mason. Aye. Council Member Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Marty Medina. Aye. Mayor Rico Medina. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff, and Mr. Reinhardt. Wanted to acknowledge that he was here as well through the presentations uh, uh, with, uh, as far as staff and answering questions of being available. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to move on to item number um, seven, which is comments from council members. Uh, this first one uh, is from myself. And what it is, is it's, uh, I'm sure we read in the, the Daily Journal, uh, for the city of San Mateo had been looking into speed limits at schools and Menlo Park has already done something. The county has some stipulations in certain areas. This is something that, as we all know, I mean, when we take our driver's tests and all that, alleys, you know, are at 15, blind intersections, 100 feet are at 15, near railroad tracks, 100 feet are at 15, right? So those are already uh, existing currently. And I, I'm, I'm, my, my belief is that for the public and private schools that we should, um, from K through 12, look into that. And there's new state law that's changed and it's very clear of what, what is okay and what is not. Um, and I think not only does it set, hopefully in a community, if this were something that's uh, plausible and the council supports, would, would have consistency, right? I just know I'm near a school, it's not 25, it's 15. I know when St. Robert's came up, they have a crosswalk. And because the cars were right there at the crosswalk, you child could not be seen as they came out into the street. So back then I had brought forward and the council said, well, let's during school terms broaden that so that there is a broader space. I, I think um, as we know, it doesn't take much time um, to have a tragic accident or incident occur. Um, I know there is no state law as far as the senior center for it being other than 25 to my knowledge or what I could find. However, I think once we're looking at one element, we have one senior center at a very busy intersection. Um, I would just like to have that looked at simultaneously. Again, there may not be anything that can be done, um, but I think it's um, uh, deserving for our youth and, and our mature population to at least uh, look at possibilities of protecting and having consistency. So that's um, my thought and suggestion. Um, and so I open it to my colleagues to see if there's any support. Uh, Vice Mayor. There it is. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I saw that uh, newspaper article and I, I 
heard of the various complaints at our schools of, of, of the traffic concerns and and observed them myself. So um, if we can look into that would be great. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing about that. So thank you for bringing this up. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Hamilton. I am also supportive of this. I think it's a great idea for us to look into this and hopefully make some um, improvements around our schools and near the senior center. And I also thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Mason. Yeah, I think um, I, it, I'm glad you brought this forth. And um, I know we live right next to the park side and it is every morning getting out of our driveway is an interesting experience um, and making sure our kids don't run in the street. Um, I will say that at our elementary school, um, the liaison was there recently and I think traffic definitely improved. So in speaking with um, the city manager after the article came out, I, I think that the, the city may already be working on this. Um, and so if they are, just keep going. And if they're not, then I, I support starting it. But my understanding is that the city is already working on this uh, with the police department and we'll be reaching out to the school district. So thank you. Council member Salazar. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, to add, I mean, I, I agree that lower speeds are definitely safer, but I, I think we also have a, a large issue with enforcement and, um, and I don't know that lowering it necessarily makes it uh, any more enforceable or increases our ability to enforce it. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, hand in hand with this, we do need to look at our ability to enforce even the existing uh, limits uh, in, in all of the areas. Uh, I mean, uh, to be honest, uh, when we have speeding everywhere, not just, uh, I mean, I know it's especially dangerous near schools where kids tend to, to dart in and out of cars, uh, but, um, you know, it's, um, it's a problem um, everywhere. And um, I also wanted to make sure that, you know, whatever uh, process we follow here, we, uh, we are following the established protocols and making sure that these items are vetted uh, by engineering and uh, they find their way to the um, TSPC uh, before, before going anywhere. So that, that's it for me. Absolutely would concur with those comments and speaking to a council member from San Mateo. Uh, on this topic, I think it is always the case, right, about um, the, the cars that speed everywhere, not just around our, our, our certain sites or U-turns, et cetera. So it is true when it comes to the enforcement. Uh, I know one of the city of San, Mate city of San Mateo's uh, relevance to go forward was, again, just trying to put that into people's minds that it's, it's trying to get the mindset from the 25 to 15 and, and as just a factor of consistency and safety. Um, so with that, I think that we have um, to go ahead in that. And so I appreciate that. I want to now ask for other council members that uh, may have items that they uh, or comments that they'd like to uh, bring up tonight. If you could uh, raise your hand and we'll start with the vice mayor. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, two quick things uh, tomorrow from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, second Harvest will be uh, providing groceries to those in need um, at 350 Third Avenue, that's Bel Air. Um, if anyone has any time to also volunteer, we, we look like we may be a little short. Uh, so if, if you have some time and you want to help your community, uh, please uh, show up at 1.30 and uh, at Bel Air Elementary School. Um, we normally get around 200 cars of people that are uh, in need of, of groceries. Um, the second thing is I wanted to uh, also thank everyone involved with the uh, community cleanup uh, drop-off um, at, the, at the Church of Later Day Saints this uh, Saturday. I know some people were waiting a long time, but it was a lot of cars, set a record, and if I can take this time just to remind everyone, you can call Recology to get your free pickup at your door at the curb, right? So make sure you get two cleanup, uh, two free pickups a year. And um, I can tell you, I, it was amazing. I dropped, I called and and they picked up my water heater, my 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 used up water heater. So um, be sure to do that, and uh, you won't have to wait in line at. Uh, 
any of our cleanups in the future. Thank you. Any other comments from council members? I'm not seeing any other hands up. Okay. Um, as before we adjourn this, as we adjourn this evening, I wanted to go ahead and adjourn in the memory of uh, Sophia Melendez. And I think uh, some of you may know the family and Alex, who is our former Park and Recreation Commissioner. Um, she was 39 years old, way too young and passed. A graduate of Cappuccino and has lived most of her life in San Bruno. Um, and uh, she was the older sister to Alex and Vanessa. Uh, one thing that I think may run in the family is Sophia loved the San Bruno uh, City Park just as much as we see Alex there all the time. Loved the Posey Parade, the Easter egg hunt, their recreational activities. Um, and some side notes, she uh, was uh, loved the creative writing, sushi, and of course being a mom. Uh, she's survived by her parents, her younger sister and brother, and her four-year-old son. Um, and this was... Um, and unfortunate when it, any tragedy like this happens. And so in memory of her, as well as all of our uh, young adults, and maybe I'm just getting up in age, but to me, uh, that's still very young. And so also, in addition, I want to adjourn in honor and in memory of all our young adults that have left us uh, way too soon. So with that, uh, let's adjourn in uh, a moment of silence. Thank you, Council. Now we'll go ahead and adjourn this meeting to the next regular City Council meeting, which will be held November the 9th at 7 p.m. Everyone enjoy the rest of your evening, your week, and have a safe and happy Halloween.